that there were 180 folks that signed up for this. I didn't even know that there were 180 nutrient management professionals in Maryland. It makes me wonder if my mom uh, contacted some of her friends in order to uh, in order to to get numbers that are so high. So I'm not sure whether to thank you, mom, or not, but I I appreciate the sentiment. Um, a couple of things about what this talk is not going to be. This talk is not going to this is not about the fundamentals of soil science or the basics of soil science as kind of a body. If that was if we were going to talk about that, we'd have to talk about soil horizons. We'd talk about soil taxonomy. We'd talk about details of organic matter. Um, we'd talk about um, details of hydrology. All those things are very, very good and very, very important and helpful to know. But they're not in this talk. And if you want that information, by all means, I, we can get it for you. But, um, but instead, this talk is about the basics of soil science as it applies to nutrient management and the basics of fertility as it applies to nutrient management, and I should say nutrient management in Maryland, the way that it occurs in Maryland. So we can provide a, a fresher up for soil science in general um, and are really happy to do it. But here, the focus more is on um, just exactly how does soil science show up uh, in Maryland nutrient management. And that was that was a talk that was the topic that I was that I was given about a month ago, and um, and I th I thought I had a great idea. I thought I would just kind of go through um, our Newman program and find out all the ways that. Uh, that we, that we ask for specific soils information and, um, and what is it? And kind of talk about those things. And as I went to put that presentation together, I realized I was in the midst of creating something incredibly boring. So um, we'll get to it in a second, but I took what had been many slides of something about how, the, how about the basics of soil science as it applies to nutrient management in Maryland, boiled it down to one slide for you. Um, so here's the strategy we're taking today. I started with a, with a talk that's about soil fertility concepts as they apply to nutrient management in Maryland. And then I've inserted in where they fit some of the fundamental soils ideas, the basic soils ideas um, that apply. So that's the strategy for today. And it's a, it's a pleasure to be with you. Thanks for being here. I'm going to stop my video. All right, and now it's all just about the slides. So thanks so very much. It's a pleasure to be with you. So here's the whole talk that it would have been pretty boring condensed into one slide. And there was something that kind of surprising came up. Is that what I was trying to do was identify all the ways that we input specific soil information into our Newman program in order for it to make a difference with respect to our, uh, with respect to the, the writing of a plan. And what's very interesting is that other than soil tests, there really isn't a lot of super specific soils information that is used. Um, take texture, for example. Texture shows up in, in, the, in the PSNT test or the recommendation that comes from a PSNT test but it shows up as a way to kind of adjust that recommendation. Um, texture shows up in Lyme recommendations. We'll see that later on. And texture shows up in a factor in the PMT. 
things like drainage class and something called the hydraulic soils group. Those show up at the, in the PMT as well. Permeability does. In fact, all the other things here that um, where we're actually asked to input directly into Newman some soil detail other than soil test information, most of it is showing up inside the PMT. So in a sense, nutrient management is very free of, uh, of soils information with the exception of soil tests. Um, for example, there's nowhere in nutrient management re generating recommendations where the overall organic matter content of the soil is needed. Um, so you can, there are some very fundamental variables in soil science and in soil functioning that are not utilized when we generate recommendations um, in Maryland. All right, so let's talk about, let's talk about soil fertility. And let's talk about soil fertility writ large. And as we go through, we're going to encounter certain basic soil science concepts. But I want to first think about soil fertility writ large. Oftentimes, when we say soil fertility, we're wondering about, we're wondering about one of the last bullet points on this list. We're wondering about this, this bullet point about nutrients. How many nutrients do we apply? But let's really keep in mind the very fundamental fact that soil, that soil fertility is about so much more than just nutrients. In order to have a fertile soil, we must have adequate water provision. The, the roots must be supplied with oxygen because roots do not get their oxygen from above. They don't get oxygen that's generated from, uh, from leaves. They get their oxygen from the soil environment. We've got to have adequate temperatures. It needs to be warm enough in spring for germination, but cool enough during the summer. The soil has to provide enough mechanical support so that um, we don't have uh, plants that are lodging. We want to, of course, keep disease or pest pressure to a minimum. And we're learning more and more and more about biological symbioses and how they can enhance um, crop health and uh, the crop population health. So all of these are very important topics in and of themselves. But um, today we're really focusing on the nutrient part. Um, the, uh, but of course, we, you don't really get soil fertility unless you have all of these things in their proper place. So that's, that's where basic soil fertility fits, but soil fertility writ large is about a lot more than that. Now, Emily, I'm gonna leave it up to you to identify questions that show up in the chat box, okay? Sounds good. Okay, thank you, ma'am. All right, so in this talk, there's really just two questions to answer. Number one, why are some soils better at supplying nutrients than others? And how do soils lose their nutrient content? So first, let's get to the definition of a nutrient. Well, nutrients, they're required to complete a plant's life cycle. They're not just required for growth, but they've got, they're, they're required to get the plant through reproduction, all right? And then the other thing about them is they can't be generated by the plants on their own. Um, for it to be a nutrient, the plant has got to be able to get it, it. It's only available to the plant because it's in the plant's environment. It's not a vitamin. Um, plants don't generate them on their own. Um, a model for how plant growth um, is based upon differential nutrient content is this, uh, the liebig sprengel law of the minimum model, which is um, itself Kind of modeled on a uh, on a on a barrel with staves of differential length, and the most limiting nutrient would be represented by the stave that uh, is lowest. So you try to fill this barrel up with uh, good fertility juice, and it leaks out 
the over top of the save that's the shortest. Um, so the growth is limited by the least present nutrient. And I think first to first approximation, that's probably true and probably a good model. But um, you know, remember, we're learning about symbioses. There's all sorts of interactions out there. What that's going to do is make something like the liebig sprengel law of the minimum probably still generally true, but it's a kind of a zeroth approximation. If we probably really want to understand about um, how soil fertility works, it's, uh, it's probably a little bit more complicated than that. And we'll, and we'll talk about that uh, coming up. All right. So what are the plant essential nutrients? Um, we've got, you know, for example, some, they're not, com they're not commonly called nutrients, but plants have got to have them. They've got to have carbon. They've got to have oxygen. They've got to have hydrogen. Um, uh, notice the carbon and oxygen are usually taken up via the leaves. Everything else is taken up uh, via the roots. And we split the, the mineral nutrients into my macro and micronutrients. The macronutrients themselves are split up into primary and secondary nutrients. But what I've gotten them here is I've gotten them in the form that the plant typically uh, would, would take them up. Um, can it be a little bit, can there be other forms a little bit more complicated than these? Sure, sure. But generally, this is what the plant's taking up when it does. And, and, and notice so many of these are ions, the ones that are taken up by the roots. They're ions. And why is that? It's because ions dissolve in water. So these things are dissolved in water and they are available to plant roots because, um, uh, because that's how that plant roots don't grab nutrients in solid form, but they, they wait until the nutrient is in aqueous form and then they can take it up. So there's a nice memnonic. Um, to memorize the essential plant nutrients. And it goes like this. C.B. Hopkins Cafe Company, closed Monday morning and night. See you soon, the management. Now, all of, now these, these elements are, are embedded here in this mnemonic, right? And so you've got things like carbon, boron, hydrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, potassium, nitrogen, sulfur, calcium and iron, cobalt, and you can see the others, closed Monday morning and night. And then CU, that's where copper is located, CU. Zinc for Zoom and the management. So I, I like this. It makes a very easy way to memorize the different um, uh, essential plant uh, elements. Now, what do plants do with nutrients? They do a lot of things with nutrients. Um, nitrogen, it's an obligate uh, element in chlorophyll and in every single building block of protein. You can't, all the amino acids contain it. Phosphorus is obligate for energy delivery and it's also part of the, the backbone of, ND, of DNA. Potassium helps to maintain the salt balance between the plant roots and the soil. Magnesium is the functioning metal in chlorophyll that makes the whole thing work. And a lot of the other essential elements like magnesium, um, metals, they play indispensable roles in kind of complex cell machinery. Let's see an example. Now, I thought we've already talked about chlorophyll and you can see on the right hand side, we've got uh, the magnesium atom held um, by four nitrogen atoms in chlorophyll. And um, what a beautiful molecule that is. What's absolutely fascinating is that if we look at hemoglobin, hemoglobin is clearly startlingly similar, which is incredible to me, incredible to me. That, um, that this is the case. It would be a wonderful to talk to a, a, a plant, an animal physiologist, and a, uh, 
geneticist and, and someone who studied um, evolutionary history. You know, is this, uh, did this occur because this structure just works really well and they was kind of convergent in this way? Or, you know, did they, do they have the same origin? Um, but just fabulous. But the point, but that, and that's wonderful, but the point here is that notice how in order to get hemoglobin to work, we need that metal atom. And in order to get chlorophyll to work, we need that other metal atom. So oftentimes, that's where these, these micronutrients, that's where they're going to be. They're going to be kind of the focal point of these very complicated proteins that do a very specific job within their protein. All right, so let's, let's start answering one of the questions that I provided at the very beginning. And, and, we're, and we're talking about soil fertility now. What is it that makes some soils better at supplying nutrients than, the, than, than others? And I'm gonna, get, I'm gonna give you the beginning of the answer. Um, the totality of the answer has to do with all the other stuff that was in that first slide that we saw. Um, water provision, oxygen provision, et cetera, et cetera. So, Here's the beginning of the answer. Some soils contain more nutrients anyway. We'll find out what, what, why, how that comes to be. And some soils can hold on to nutrients better than others. We'll find out about that too. All right, so why is it that some soils inherently contain more nutrients? Well, that's because some soils developed from nutrient-rich geologies. Others did not. So here's some fairly common uh, minerals on the earth. Some of them are clays, some of them are uh, primary minerals. And if we've got a soil that develops mostly on quartz sand or quartzite rock, we can see that we don't we're not really starting with too much. We're starting with something that um, contains no essential elements uh, for, uh, for plants. Sure, some grasses will use silicon um, uh, as they grow. It's one of the reasons why if you've ever cut yourself on grass, you can probably thank a, a silicon crystal that's inside the margins of, that, of, the, of the grass blade. But if we're starting off with something like quartz or quartzite, we're probably not going to have a very fertile soil by the time we by the time we're done. If we're starting off with something like olivine, well, at least we've got some calcium and magnesium to begin with. If we're starting off with pure kaolinite, not a lot there. But if we're starting off with some muscovite, you got a little something. The um, now as as landscapes evolve. There's all sorts of things, erosion. Um, we, can have, we have material tumbling downhill. We have wind erosion that's picking up dust and depositing it somewhere else. So we're virtually never ever in a situation where we're developing ourselves, we're developing a soil exclusively out of one isolated geology, which is one of the reasons why you can have a soil that's developed on quartz or quartzite, but it's actually going to have some fertility to it. But I think you see the point. What you start with can matter a lot. You know, some of the arguably the finest soils in Maryland in the Frederick Valley, what are we doing? We're starting off with limestone. And that limestone is going to be dirty limestone. It's going to have, obviously, calcium and magnesium carbonate, but it's going to have some silicates in there. And there's going to be just other stuff that uh, that ultimately provides all of the nutrients that we that that a plant needs. Um, so, what about the second question? Why do some soils hold more nutrients than others? Well, the answer is because some soils differ in organic matter content. 
they differ in their relative amount of sand and silt and clay. All right, so the texture is different. They differ in the amount of the different types of clays that we have. And also, the, so the, the soils differ fundamentally in pH, though pH is a very changeable variable over time in soils. So here's a really nice table of data that indicates that, that soils or soil material differs greatly in its ability to hold charge. And we'll talk about why that's important but it differs greatly in its ability to hold charge. Um, organic matter can hold tons, clearly. The different clays can hold a lot or not too much, depending on what type of clay. And then silts and sands, the truth is they can hold a little bit of charge, but the, but the amount is so vanishingly small that it might as well be zero. So that's why those are zeros there. Um, now, incidentally, what are the clays that are most, uh, that are most predominant in, um, in Maryland? Probably clays that are more like, more like kaolinite or the iron oxides. Maryland soils are fairly weathered. So, um, and so that means that we've got these clays that uh, it turns out don't hold as much charge as others would. Now, you can see that as we go up in this table, these different materials have increasing surface area. Um, so we, obviously interactions occur at surfaces. So we have the greater ability to hold stuff in general um, as we have greater surface area. But also there's a certain amount of embedded charge in these materials that, um, that allows them to, to hold on to, uh, to positive charge, and that um, which itself indicates a lot about soil fertility. So let's keep talking about this idea of being able to hold charge. The ability to hold charge is called ion exchange capacity. And if you think about it, it makes a lot of sense. Ions are charged particles. So if soil material or soils can hold charge, they have the ability to hold ions. And that makes a lot of sense that it has to do with soil fertility because you remember so many of those essential plant nutrients are ions in the form that they're taken up by the plant. So in soils, we've got the ability, the differential ability to hold onto ions. It's gonna make some soils more fertile than others. Um, and precisely because they can hold on to ions, um, they can be fertile for plants. Now, of course, we don't want soils to hold on to ions too hard. If they hold on to ions too hard, then the plant can't access it because those ions aren't going to be dissolved in water. Um, but, it, but happily, that's the way soils work. This ability that they have to hold ions is not absolute. Um, the, uh, they can hold on to them pretty well, but they don't hold on to them forever. And the fact that, uh, that they can let these things go means that this ability to hold on to ions is called this exchangeable ability. So you can imagine that, um, that uh, just because a soil particle is holding on to a certain plant nutrient that's charged now, doesn't mean that we'll always be holding on to it. If you if you introduce a different charge to the soil water, it can go and kind of like being at a um, being at a, at a bar where people sit down on stools at the bar, but they come and go um, as a, um, but they they can come and go. So it, it works very much that way, and we'll talk about that more in a little while. Now ions come in different forms; they can be positively charged they can be negatively charged. We call that positive, the, the ability to hold positive charges, we call that cation exchange capacity. And the ability to hold negatively charged particles, anion exchange capacity. Um, and how do we measure it? We measure it in the amount of charge that can be retained by a certain amount of soil. Now notice we're not talking about 
the, the unit here is about the amount of charge that can be held. It's not a unit that's about the number of atoms that can be held, right? So cation exchange capacity, anion exchange capacity. It's not about the number of atoms that, that these things can hold. It's about the amount of charge that they can hold. And the units that we use are both interchangeable. Names are completely different, but they mean the same amount. You can either talk in centimoles of charge per kilogram, or you can talk about milliequivalents of charge per 100 gram. Where did that unit have its origin? I don't know. Um, I'm not sure. But for me, centimoles of charge per kilogram is much more intuitive. The, uh, but, I, but happily, if you see it in milliequivalents of charge per 100 gram, no problem. It means the same thing. Now, even centimoles of charge per kilogram might be a little bit troublesome, right? It includes the metric system centa plus moles. So remember what one mole is. It's basically like a really big dozen. You know, when we buy eggs, we buy them in units of dozens usually. Um, but atoms are so small, ions are so small, that when we count them up, it doesn't make sense to count them up in units of 12. Instead, we count them up in units of much of, very, of a huge number because atoms are so small. When we work with them, we're always working with a huge number. So what, a mole, 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd, just think of it as a really big dozen. Um, a handful of carbon atoms is about, it's about 12 grams and and, uh, and that's one mole of carbon atoms. It's literally a handful. When we talk about the ability of soils to retain charge, it turns out that moles of charge is a little bit too big. Instead, one kilogram of soil, better order of magnitude for that is that it can hold about one one hundredth of a mole of charge. And so that's why we get centimoles. So, one one hundredth of a mole of charge on that order is what soils can hold per kilogram. One last note. For most soils, um, and this is because it's true for organic matter and for most clays, cation exchange capacity is a lot bigger than anion exchange capacity. So soils in Maryland have a much better ability to hold on to positive charge than they do to hold on to negative charges. The reasons why nitrate, which has a charge of negative one, um, is so leachable in soils in Maryland because our soils have the ability to hold on to negative charge, but it's relatively small. So nitrate, um, nitrate will uh, move through the soil pretty fast instead of something like ammonium, which is also a form of nitrogen, but has a positive charge. That won't move through the soil quickly because the soil has much greater capacity um, to, uh, to hold on to positive charges. Now there's only one, there's a, there's, what's the exception to this? That cation exchange capacity is greater than anion exchange capacity. That occurs with iron oxides in aluminum oxides. Their ability to hold on to positive charges and negative charges is about the same. Um, we've got a decent amount of those in Maryland, but it's always a small percentage. It's you know 2%, 3%, something like that. If you go down to the, to the rainforest, where soils are most heavily weathered, then those percentages grow a lot. And so it turns out that rainforest soils are able to hold on to negatively charged particles um, better than any other soils on Earth. All right. Now we talked just earlier when we were talking about parent materials and how some soils are naturally more fertile than others. That one of the reasons is because they started off with, uh, with more fertile parent, parent materials to begin with. But we said that because of mixing, because of sedimentation, wind erosion, water erosion, um, that, that in real life, 
our parent materials get mixed. And so for that reason, very rarely do we ever have soils that are just pure true sands or pure true silts or pure true clays. Soils are usually a mixture of these things. So even something that we call a sand, we know it's not pure. We know that it contains some silt. We know that it contains some clays. But the soil, it probably also contains some organic matter. So in the real world, sandy soils have some ability to hold on to positive charges. Is it a whole lot? No, it's relatively small because most of the material is sandy. But there's going to be a little bit of clay there, a little bit of organic matter. It's going to be doing work for us. The, um, as, we, as we get to finer and finer textures, we get more surface area. We likely have more uh, diversity of clays and greater percentages. And so our ability to hold on to it to positive charges increases. All right, so how could we determine the exchange capacity of a soil? Well, one of the things that we can do is we could measure, we could extract from the soil material um, all of the dissolved ions that are stuck to it. We could count them up and then we could determine what the cation exchange capacity of a soil is. We could determine its ability to, to retain positive charge by counting up the positive charge. So you could imagine going into a laboratory and extracting from the soil um, a certain number of hydrogen ions, potassium ions, et cetera, et cetera, each with its own charge. And then we could uh, calculate what this ability of the soil to hold positive charges is. And so here we've got, remember the important thing is not number of atoms, it's number of charge. So we've got three centimoles of charge from hydrogen, four centimoles of charge from potassium, et cetera, et cetera. And if we wanna know the cation exchange capacity of this soil, remember we're extracting this from one kilogram of soil, it's just as simple as adding up all the charge that that soil was holding, all right? So in this case, it comes out to 25 centimoles of positive charge per kilogram. And how did we do it? We just added up the positive charge that was stuck to that soil. We added to that soil some amount of some kind of extracting solution that could get these ions that were stuck to the soil off so that we could count them up. So clays are the ones that are doing a lot, organic matter and clays are the ones that are doing a lot of work in terms of holding this charge. And so here's what it would kind of look like if we had a microscope. Clays are something special. They're not like silt or sand. Um, clays are little crystals in effect. Uh, sometimes they look more crystalline than others, but, it, but, they're, but they're essentially crystalline. And so we've got a couple layers of crystal here, clay crystal for you. We've looked in it with a microscope. And you can see that stuck to those layers at the edges and on the surfaces are all these positively charged ions. We're not putting in the negatively charged ions here because um, we know that the anion exchange capacity is a lot less. So this is kind of a simplistic view. But, um, but this is what it looks like if we could kind of look, look, look with a microscope. And these things can get off of the clay particle and go into solution. And ions that are in the soil water can adhere to it. And so that's where we get this idea of exchange. So think about it then, the chemistry of the soil solution and the cation exchange capacity um, or what's on the cation exchange capacity of clays, they influence one another. Essentially, we're talking about one system where we have what's dissolved in the soil water is helping to decide what's stuck to the clay particles and vice versa. And whenever we change the chemistry of the soil water, 
we're going to be changing, we're going to be kicking some stuff off of the cation exchange capacity, and we'll be, um, and we'll be introducing some of that stuff from the soil water to it. So they're, they're interacting with one another. It's really multiple parts, but one system. Here's what that looks like, probably a little bit better illustrated. So we've got the soil water, and we have, um, and we have the, the soil itself. And we can see ions that are dissolved in the soil water, and we can see ions that are stuck to the exchange capacity. Um, we can also see certain ions being attracted to, uh, or the, the root doing the work of attracting some ions to it. So we've got two parts of this system, what's dissolved in the soil water and what's stuck onto the soil solids. Now, notice that what's dissolved in the soil water, that's the stuff that's available to the plant. If it's stuck on the soil, it's not, a, it's not available right then. It's gotta get dissolved into the soil water first. When we do a soil fertility test though, we're not measuring the soil water, the contents of the soil water, we're measuring what's stuck to the soil, to the cation exchange capacity of the soil. So um, I think that takes, that takes care of the first part of that table. Low, the lower part of the table has to do with hydrogen ions, which are so important. They, even though they're cations, we can kind of put them in their own category. Um, hydrogen ions that are dissolved in the soil water they kind of have their own name. We call that active acidity. It's the pH, if you were to, if you were to take the pH of the soil, of, of the soil water slurry, it's what you would get, it would be the pH of that. Those are the hydrogen ions that dissolve in water. Um, but there's also hydrogen ions, they're cations, that are stuck to the cation exchange capacity of the soil. Um, and we call those reserve acidity. Um, because those aren't, those aren't active right now. They're not in the soil water, but they could become active at any time. They could desorb from the soil and go into the soil water. And sometimes a laboratory will do a different type of pH test where they use some kind of, they use some kind of buffer and they, um, they challenge, they challenge the, uh, the, the, the hydrogen ions that are stuck to the, to the soil to come off. And they see just how, how many are there, just how easily or hard is it to change the, um, the pH of that buffer solution. And so when we're, you, when we're looking at a, a, a buffer test with pH, we're looking more at the reserve acidity, the amount of hydrogen ions that are absorbed to the soil. Now, a couple of things to note here. In general, the ion exchange capacity in the soil is a whole lot bigger than whatever happens to be dissolved in the soil water at any one time. A whole lot bigger. Um, and, and this is an interesting one too, think about this. If we've got acid conditions, that means we've got more hydrogen ions in the soil water. And it means that we've got more hydrogen ions that are sorbed to the cation exchange capacity of the soil. That means that we've got a bunch of positive charges in the form of hydrogen ions, which really aren't that great nutrients, that are taking up space on the cation exchange capacity of the soil. So in effect, we reduce the, the, we, re, we reduce the soil's ability to hold nutrients if the soil's pH is too low. And why is that? It's because the hydrogen, these, these excessive hydrogen ions that we get when we have an acid solution, an acid situation, they're stuck to the soil and are as positive charges, they're taking up room. They're taking up that capacity and making it harder for some of the positively charged uh, nutrients that we might like to have, um, making it harder for them to be retained. So in, a set, in essence, 
cation exchange capacity, it's due to organic matter content, the, um, the amount and type of clays, but it's also, it also can be affected by pH. Lower pH effectively um, lowers the share of the cation exchange capacity that, um, that, that, that's available to nutrients. All right, now, where do we get that cation exchange capacity from? Well, if we could take all the cations away that were absorbed to a clay particle and somehow just magically sweep them off, and we looked at the clay particle itself, what we'd see is we'd see all these embedded negative charges that are, uh, that are on the clay particle. And these negative charges aren't placed there. These negative charges were, um, they, they were built into the clay as it was forming. If you take something like kaolinite, for example, it contains a, it's a fairly simple chemical formula of silicon, aluminum, and oxygen and hydrogen. And pure kaolinite is used to make porcelain. Um, very fine, very white, China. However, porcelain deposits or pure kaolinite deposits are really very rare. There aren't a lot of them. And, and that makes sense because we know of this, the mixing that occurs of parent materials over time on the Earth's surface. So the chance that we would be in a place where we are starting off with a kind of a kind of a, a perfect chemistry with no compromises and no dirtiness is very very low. So you could get if you could if you could grow pure kaolinite, then it would have very little charge embedded in it because all of the atoms, the silicons and the oxygens, the aluminums, the hydrogens they would all fit together perfectly, balancing one another. But that's very, very rare. Typically, we'll have not only silicons and aluminums, oxygens and hydrogens around, but we'll have ever, a little bit of everything else, manganese and, uh, and iron. I mean, you name it. All the, all the, all the usual suspects that, we, that we've already encountered from earlier in, in the presentation. Because these because these impurities exist at even fairly small concentrations, as a, clay, as a clay crystal is forming, some of these impurities get embedded in. And while some of these impurities might have the same kind of size as a silicon or aluminum atom, they might not have the same charge. And so what happens is that as clay particles are forming, because they're forming out of dirty soil water, um, the, uh, and because some of, the, some of the atoms that are going into the clay particle are substituting for, uh, for others, we get this embedded, create, created negative charge that is built into the clay as it's forming. There's a fancy word for this, the idea that you could have a, um, an atom of, of, a, of a slightly lower charge, uh, occupying the place of an atom with a slightly higher charge, because that's how it works. Um, it's called isomorphic substitution. Isomorphic meaning same shape. Um, so we get a clay particle, kind of like we were expecting, but instead of being neutral, it's negatively charged. And the long, and the, and the long story short is why does this happen? It happens because clays form typically in dirty soil water. And so because of these impurities, these negative charges get um, built in. Now, there's a very important point here as far as basic soil science goes. Um, it's that clays are fundamentally different in nature than silts and sands and gravels are, right? You can start with mountains and then you can, you can make boulders and you can have gravels and sands and silts and all they are are just different particle sizes, starting with something really big 
it gets mechanically broken down into smaller pieces. It's the same minerals, but it's just smaller sizes. Clay particles, which are much small, they're smaller than sands or silts, predominantly, and predominantly are not just silt particles that got smashed just a little bit more. Rather, clay particles are crystals that formed out of dirty soil water. Silts, not the case. Silts are just broken up sands. Sands, not the case. They're just broken up gravels. But clays are fundamentally different. They are crystals that are formed, that are precipitated out of the soil water. Um, could happen for any number of reasons. The soil water is, uh, is got these dissolved materials and the pH changes, which, may, which means that there are certain minerals that or certain atoms that simply can't be dissolved anymore. And so they have to form, they have to form a crystal. And so that's how we get our clays. So a fundamental soil science idea here um, is that clay particles are just fundamentally different. It's one of the reasons why, they're, why they have this embedded negative charge and, um, and uh, other particle sizes do not. Another important point to make here is that the greater, the, uh, the greater a particle's ability to absorb or attract cations, so the greater the cation exchange capacity, the more residual acidity there's going to be um, and the more lime you're going to have to, to do to change the pH of that soil. Think about it. Up in, in the upper part, we've got a clay particle with lots of, with, with high cation exchange capacity because it's got a lot of embedded negative charge and all our positives are stuck to it. If we were going to add enough lime to neutralize all those hydrogens, we'd have to add a lot of lime. We've got a lot of hydrogens to neutralize. But take a soil that's built out of clays that are like below. We still got some hydrogens we have to neutralize, but we don't have as many because we're starting off with a soil that has less cation exchange capacity in the first place. Less ability to hold positive charges means less hydrogens around in the first place. And so therefore, we're not going to have to add as much lime to that soil in order to change its pH. So, so very good. Now, how do we see this? When we, uh, when we go about creating Lyme recommendations in Maryland. So here is, our, is SFM5, which is the reigning document in Maryland with recommendations about how much Lyme to add in a particular place, um, starting with a particular pH to get to whatever pH you want. And we've been talking about cation exchange capacity and I've told you that cation exchange capacity um, affects the, the liming rate that, you, that you'll have. We've also talked earlier about how texture um, influences it. But here's the interesting thing. We can see texture here, okay? We've got loamy sands and sandy loams, loams, silt loams and clay loams. So texture is clearly a factor here, but where's the cation exchange capacity? Now keep in mind how we should use SFM5. The table that I've got for you here um, is a table that we would use if we our target soil pH was six and a half. The, um, we then, based on a soil test, a soil water slurry, would ask ourselves, well, what's my starting pH? And we would, um, we would identify that. Let's say our starting pH was 5.7. So our target pH is six and a half. So we're going to use this table in SFM5. We've identified our initial soil pH from a soil water slurry test from a laboratory. And now we've got to ask, well, how many, um, how many pounds of liming agent will I add? Well, notice that if you're in soils that are really sandy, they don't make any distinction between different places in Maryland. If you've got really sandy soils, you're just gonna add the, the prescribed amount. 
But notice that it changes when you get into soils that have a little bit more clay content, right? Um, loams, silt loams and clay loams, not just, the, not just the texture matters, but where in Maryland you are matters. So I've told you that cation exchange capacity matters to, uh, to determining liming rates. And I've told you that you can even use a pH buffer test to help you uh, determine that. A lot of other states do that. I think Illinois does that. Pennsylvania does that. But here's the Maryland recommendation. There's no mention of any pH buffer test. There's not, there's not mention of CEC. So where's this, where, where's, how does this relate to anything? Well, the idea, the idea is, is here. Cation exchange capacity, or the, where we are in Maryland, is used in our SFM5 document as a proxy to the relative cation exchange capacity in the soils that are present. In the Piedmont and mountain regions, we have soils that are generally a little bit younger. What did they do? They've evolved out of in place. Generally, they've evolved in place out of the rock that's been there. Um, whereas coastal plain soils, those soils have been made out of parent materials that have been moved hundreds of miles to the east from the eroding Appalachian Mountains. Um, most of that has been done by rivers, modern or historic. And so these things are, are in general much more weathered. And so we're gonna have more weathered clays, less weathered clays in the Piedmont, Piedmont and mountain areas. And so, and so we tend to have higher cation exchange capacities um, in the Piedmont and mountain regions of Maryland than in the coastal plain. And because we have higher cation exchange capacities, we'll have to apply more lime. Um, we apply, we don't need as much lime in the coastal plain because we have soils that have less cation exchange capacity to begin with. And that's because in the coastal plain, we're starting off with soils that are a little bit more weathered, a little bit more like kaolinite and iron oxides. Whereas in the Piedmont and mountain regions, we're starting off with soils that are less weathered. We've got some of those other clays that have a higher cation exchange capacity too. Emily, is there a question? Yes, there is. Um, we have a question about the difference between soil pH and buffer index. Okay, so soil pH, that's where you're taking a soil water slurry and you're simply asking, what's the pH of my soil water slurry? The buffer index is when you take a is when you take a chemical solution that is designed to stay about at a certain pH. It um it has some ability to buffer itself, so you could add some acidity to it, but its pH isn't going to change too much. You could add some alkalinity to it, but it's designed not to have its it's designed not to have its pH change too much. And although the pH will change a little bit, what you can do is you can you, you can take that small amount of change and have a fairly precise idea about how much acidity came into the soil as a result. So, the, um, so a, what a buffer solution does is it does something fundamentally different from a, from, a, um, from a standard pH test. The standard pH test is simply asking, what's the concentration of hydrogen ions that dissolve in water? The buffer test, is designed to extract hydrogens from, from the cation exchange capacity and measure just how many are there. So we're measuring two fundamentally different things. The first is measuring active acidity. The second is measuring residual acidity. And then I have another question, which I, I believe I've understood as, um, is there a limit of how much lime you can or are allowed to apply to the soil? Well, sir, or should yeah, yeah. You don't want to um, you don't want to add too much because number one, the uh, especially our row crops, they like it in a certain they they like a certain window of pH. We'll see something like we'll see something about that coming up. Um, six and a half is a really nice target for for most row crops. 
Take corn, for instance. If you add too much lime, lime you might blow past that, and you wouldn't want to. Um, you wouldn't want to get yourself uh, too far past neutral for most, for most crops. Um, some plants might love that, but they're probably not agronomic, and there probably aren't too many of them. Another problem with adding too much lime is you could actually burn the, uh, you could actually kind of create a really inhospitable environment for plants. So, so you don't want to add too much. And there's a rule of thumb about it. And I can't recall what the rule of thumb is right off the bat. Emily, do you remember? I think it might be in the SF, SFM5 document itself. Um, yeah, you typically don't, I, I was answering a question, um, so I wasn't listening all the way, <laughs> um, but I think if you're talking about the maximum limit we recommend is usually not over about one, one and a half or two tons per acre. Very good. David, David I think it's two tons, and if you have a recommendation that's higher than that, you would apply it in a split application. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Emily. Um, and I encourage you to look at the SFM5 document. It, uh, it, will con it, will, it, will mention, it will mention that. How about anything else at this time? Yes, um, and I'm not sure if you get into this more in a moment, but there's a question about um, the actual oxide content, correcting for that between different liming agents. Um, yes. Yeah. That, um, you definitely have to do that. Not all liming materials are the same. Uh, right here, this table that we're looking at from the SFM5 document, it's assuming pure, it's assuming liming materials as pure oxides, which are very powerful liming agents. Um, those are hard to find probably and would be very expensive um, and might be dangerous actually. You, you really have to be careful not to add too much. In the real world, liming agents might not be made out of oxides like calcium oxide, CaO, but might be, cal might be a completely different formula like calcium carbonate, still capable of raising pH um, but with kind of less, but with less power so that you would have to add more of them. And even then, even if you're buying something that is calcium carbonate based, chances are very much of what you're buying is going to be inert from a liming perspective. It'll contain lots of silicates, for example, um, which, uh, which don't hinder the liming ability, but they don't help it either. And why would those be in there? Because we're talking about real world um, mining of liming material. And in the real world, uh, calcium carbonate is, uh, calcium carbonate deposits are gonna be full of, uh, of other things. So yes, when it comes to liming, there are, there's definitely an adjustment that one does to get the right liming rate. That adjustment is in um, SFM5. And if in a future webinar, we'd like to discuss the details of how exactly it's done, then um, be very, very easy to do. That's not the purpose, that's not the purpose in, in this webinar, but the question definitely makes me think that perhaps it's a webinar that would be considered helpful. Um, you're very welcome to ask me a question. I think you've got my email. It's at the very first slide of the presentation. I'd be happy to answer any question that you might have about liming, but um, Emily is perfectly capable of it. Paul is perfectly capable of it. And um, uh, so if you've got a persistent question and SFM5 doesn't bring clarity, then definitely reach out to us. Thank you. How about something else? Okay. Um, so very good. So this is how the rubber hits the road in Maryland. Um, it's through the SFM5 document. And when nutrient, when lining recommendations are provided by Newman, there, it's essentially 
doing, it's essentially doing the, uh, the SFM5 process. Remember one of the first pages of Newman, it asks what geographic province you're in. So, um, so uh, and why does it do that? Because it's gonna, it's gonna use that um, when it's gonna create a Lyme recommendation for you. And of course, why does it ask for that geologic province? Because it's using that as a proxy for cation exchange capacity. All right. Something related to basic soil science that um, doesn't actually, we don't really have to deal with it too much in our nutrient management planning, but it's related to cation exchange capacity. And it turns out is used in, in soil science to create a fundamental differences between different soil types. Um, it's something called base saturation. So there's particular interest in the portion of absorbed elements onto the cation exchange capacity that are not acidic. We might call them basic elements, right? And so therefore, this is the share of basic cations that are stuck with the cation exchange capacity. And that particular, that share is called the base saturation. So we've got, here's some of the, here's a little table that shows what, what are considered the acid cations and what are considered the basic cations. Hydrogen is considered an acid cation because it is virtually the definition of acidity. The others are called acid cations because if you dissolve them in water, um, they will actually create acidity. They will break apart water molecules and uh, create acidity. We're going to see a chemical formula for that coming up, but any one of these will do it. And Part of the reason why they do that is look at the really high positive charge that they have. That really high positive charge means that they stress water molecules a lot when the water molecules get close. And they stress those water molecules so much that they actually pull the water molecules apart. They make one of the hydrogens come off and what's left, off, what's left over is a negatively charged OH those negatively charged OHs get attracted to them and the leftover positive hydrogen is off floating in the water. And that's how those things actually create acidity. So we call those acid cations. We'll see, in it, we'll see the chemical formula for that coming up. The basic cations, they don't have as much charge. A water molecule might be a little stressed being around them, but the water molecule doesn't get broken up and there's no free hydrogen that gets created. So the basic cations, if they're dissolved in water, they don't really change the pH too much. They also tend to be more predominant in, um, in more alkaline soil water. The acid cations are more predominant in acidic soil water. So here's this idea of base saturation. It's equal to the share of the cation exchange capacity that's provided by the basic cations. And so here's the formula we're gonna count up the centimoles of charge that we get from the, the absorbed magnesium, calcium, sodium, potassium, the basic, the basic cations, and we're gonna dissolve by the cation exchange capacity. So we've got the, the whole cation exchange capacity of the soil in the denominator. We've got the share of the positive charge that's created by the basic cations in the numerator. That's how we get the so-called base saturation. And um, it's a mean of, means of gauging soil fertility. Notice that aluminum is not a uh, aluminum is not a plant essential element, right? Um, and if our pH is too low, we, our plants are, are going to have a harder time. But with the basic cations, we need we need a lot more of those than we need any iron or man manganese, and so. Uh, so it's essentially a means of gauging soil fertility. What share of the cation exchange capacity is taken up with these basic cations? And it's considered so fundamental in soil taxonomy that it's the difference between two soil orders. Um, the horizons are the same. They might even look the same, but it comes down to a chemical test. If the, uh, if the base saturation is below a certain threshold, meaning that the soil is more acidic in its lower part, 
then we have something called an ultisol, which is kind of the dominant soil in Maryland. If, uh, if, we, um, if, if we have, uh, if the, the, the lower part of the soil is higher, a little above a threshold as far as the base saturation goes, then we have a completely different uh, soil that's relatively rare in Maryland, present in the Frederick Valley, called an alpha-sol. So uh, base saturation is considered is pretty important when it comes to soil taxonomy. And it's also not too hard to, uh, to calculate. So here's that soil that we looked at before. The kinetic change capacity of the soil was uh, 25 centimoles of positive charge per kilogram. But we could ask, what's the base saturation? So if we were going to do that, we'd add up the charge from the basic cations, and that's calcium, magnesium, sodium, and potassium. In the real world, of course, there'd be many other cations here, but we're kind of doing, but, but you get the idea. So there's only one charge contribution that we're not going to add, that we're not going to use in the numerator here. We're not going to use the, the charge uh, from hydrogen ions, because those are not basic cations. They're acidic ones. So we're going to add the 12 centimoles of positive charge from calcium, five from, mag from uh, magnesium, one from sodium, one from potassium. And then we'll divide by the overall cation exchange capacity. And we get something, um, we get a fairly high number. In the drier a region is, oftentimes the higher the base saturation will be. That's because the bases are not leached out. And because there's a limit um, in rainfall, or there's limited rainfall, there's also a limited um, addition of acidity that takes place. I spent the first few years of my career in Texas, and there the base saturation was oftentimes 100%, or so close to 100% that it was treated that way. Okay. So let's talk about pH just a little bit. We know that pH affects nutrient availability, but what is it? Um, well, it's a measure of the amount of acidity in the soil. And there's this interaction, and it's a measure of amount of acidity in the soil. Um, alkalinity would be a measure of the amount of hydroxyls in the soil. The uh, acidity is shorthand for the number of dissolved hydrogens that we have. Now here's something incredibly wonderful and fundamental. In acidic soil water or acidic soils, hydrogens are more abundant, hydroxyls are less abundant. And in alkaline soils, hydroxyls are more abundant and um, hydrogen ions are less abundant. But here's the best part. It turns out that the relationship between these two things, it's not just a trade-off, but it's actually much more precise than that. When the one goes up by a certain amount, the other must go down by exactly that amount. So, um, so these things have a, play a zero-sum game with one another. When one goes up by a certain amount, the other must go down by a certain amount. And let's take a look at that. So we've got various pHs here on the right-hand side of this, uh, of this table pH is one through nine. And, um, and you can see that the pHs are provided on the right-hand side. And on the left-hand side, we have the, the, the concentration of hydrogen atoms that um, is necessary to give that pH. Now, the formula for pH looks a little complicated, but it's getting at actually a very simple truth. If pH is one, that means that we have one tenth of a mole of hydrogen atoms dissolved per liter. All right. And on the, the far left column, the middle column, it's the same information. On the left hand side, we provide it as a decimal. In the middle section, we provide it as a uh, in scientific notation. But they mean exactly the same thing. Now we're talking about one tenth, 10 to the negative one for a pH of one. Um, for a pH of two, we've got one one hundredth of a mole of hydrogen ions dissolved per liter. All right. 
And that corresponds to 10 to the negative two. So we might think of, we might be tempted to think of pH as really terribly complicated, but what it really is doing is it's just telling us about the exponent that has to go in the hydrogen ion concentration for, for us to describe it. So it's just really, it's actually fairly simple. pH of nine, we've got um, one times 10 to the ninth moles of hydrogen ion dissolved, hydrogen ions dissolved per liter. And the pH formula is simply getting at that. Now, the most wonderful way that I ever heard logarithms talked about is that a logarithm is an exponent. Um, a logarithm will take a number with an exponent and it'll simply pull the exponent out. So if I take the log of 10 to the one, I'll get one. If I take the log of 10 to the ninth, I'll get nine. So if I take the log of 10 to the negative ninth, I'll get a negative nine. Um, so what a log does is it simply pulls the exponent out. And so if we want to get, if we want to know the relationship between pH and hydrogen ion concentration, what, we're, what we'll do is we'll take the log of the hydrogen ion concentration. But because hydrogen ion concentrations are always fairly small, meaning that we've got a bunch of um, zeros in front of them, we're always talking about negative exponents. And so simply to get that negative sign away, we'll put a negative in front of the log once we take it. And so, and so hence, that's how we get from the middle column to the column on the right-hand side. That's how the formula for, uh, for pH works. Now, there's also this idea that hydrogen ions and hydroxyl ions, that they play a zero-sum game, that when one goes up, the other goes down. And so let's see how that works. So if we look at now, if we look at a column of hydroxyl ions that correspond to those pHs, notice what we have. For a pH of one, the hydroxyl ion concentration is 10 to the negative 13, all right? For a pH of two, it's 10 to the negative 12. And as we go up in pH, those hyd that hydroxyl ion concentration gets bigger and bigger and bigger because 10 to the negative 13 has a whole bunch more zeros in front of it than, um, than 10 to the negative five does. So as we march upwards in pH, our hydrogen ion concentration is marching down in a very regular way. And our hydroxyl ion concentration is marching up in a very regular way. However, the much the one goes up, the other goes down. And so hence we see that hydrogen and hydroxyls, they play a zero sum game. And this is, this is the beautiful thing about this is this is true in all water solutions everywhere. It doesn't matter whether it's in your bathtub um, with whatever salts are dissolved in it. It doesn't matter whether it's the ocean doesn't matter where in the ocean you are. It doesn't matter uh, what stream or river or, uh, or underground aquifer you're talking about. But this relationship between hydroxyl concentrations and hydrogen ion concentrations is always true. When one goes up, the other goes down. Now, notice something that if you were to add the exponents of the hydrogen ions to the hydroxyl ions, you'll always get the same number. You'll get negative 14. So we can, we, can actually, um, we can actually get this into, we can use a chemical formula to describe this. That, oh, I didn't even show it. Well, I, so, so in other words, sorry about that. The hydrogen ion concentration times the hydroxyl ion concentration will always be 10 to the negative 14. Um, it doesn't matter which, what the one is, the other will be different such that you'll always get 10 to the negative 14. 
And so that's why I say that these things play a zero sum game. And the beautiful thing is it doesn't matter what water you're talking about, the type of water, where on earth you are, even if you're on Mars, it's always going to be true. So we know that pH is important and here's how come. Notice that between about six and six and a half, maybe a little bit above six and a half, most of the different plant available nutrients or essential plant nutrients are maximally available between those, between those pHs. So it's not a surprise, they're, they're, there's more of it dissolved in the soil water on average for, that, for this whole population of different plant essential nutrients. So it's not a surprise that a lot of plants would prefer those pHs because that's where they have easiest access to, to many of these things. Um, notice that if you veer away from, from that sweet spot between six and six and a half, if you veer too far away, then you might run into problems. Um, aluminum is not a plant essential nutrient but look at it becoming um, dissolved and becoming very available as you get to lower pHs. Um, at that point, aluminum becomes a toxin. Aluminum is everywhere in soils. It's a huge percentage of what we have in dirt, but usually soil pHs are above five and a half, so that are oftentimes are above five and a half, so that there might be tons of aluminum in the soil, but none of it or very little of it is dissolved in the soil water. So we don't have the chance of an aluminum toxicity. But if we get to those lower pHs, there's much more aluminum that, can, that is dissolved in the soil water, and we have the chance for an aluminum toxicity to develop in a plant. Um, you can also have iron toxicities. Um, so we don't want pHs that are too extreme. Yeah, we want pHs that are kind of right in that sweet spot between six and six and a half or six and 6.7. Um, it also matters to bacteria. We've got nitrogen fixation that is, um, that is really maximized by, uh, by in neutral situations or very slightly acidic um, situations. And for biosolids applications, We've got to get the pH within a certain window. If it's too acid, then, um, then it can't be applied. We'd have to ask somebody else about why exactly that is. It may be because of heavy metals that are present in biosolids. And if we're spreading biosolids onto soils that are too acidic, then we might get those heavy metals to become more available and into the soil water, and therefore creating problems. So here's some target pHs for Maryland, um, for alfalfa likes it more neutral, tobacco and uh, potatoes like it, like it more uh, acidic, most heart or horticultural crops uh, and agronomic crops, pH is six and a half. Okay, so we've talked about why it is that some soils are more fertile than others. And remember, we're talking about fertile in, the, in the, the small sense in terms of supplying nutrients. Part of the reason was because those soils developed in place out of parent materials that were simply more nutrient rich to begin with. The other part of the reason is that those soils have constituents that allow them to hold on to those plant essential nutrients better. Many of those plant essential nutrients are, ca are cations. And so if we've got a soil that can hold on to cations better, we've got a soil that um, will be able to provide greater fertility. And that capacity came down to organic matter and the amount of, and types of clays and, and, and knowing that pH can adjust it at the margins. All right, but now let's ask a different question. How is it the soils can lose their ability to supply nutrients? I mean, we're having to add nutrients all the time. That's the point of a nutrient management plan. Um, what is it, why is it that our soils would lose uh, nutrients over time? All right, now, soil-based nutrients are ionic, like we've mentioned before. All those mineral-based uh, 
plant essential nutrients are um, have got some kind of charge to them, except for that one that one type of boron. So, soil based nutrients are are ion, and ions can do lots of different things. They can stick to um, charges in the soil, or they can dissolve in the soil water. And remember that plants can only take things up if they're dissolved in the soil water. Now let's think about what might be good or bad about this. Well, if something's dissolved in soil water, what's great about that is that it's available to plants. But what's bad about that is that it could leach out of the root zone as it rains and as, um, as rainwater descends through the soil profile, it can take those easily soluble nutrients and move them out of the root zone. We know that about 50% of the nitrogen that we apply never gets into the, our target crop, um, that it's simply leached out. Um, and so we can get leaching that occurs with nitrate. We can get leaching that can occur with phosphate. Leaching of nitrate is much easier to do. Nitrate has a single negative charge, which means that um, it can't grab onto anything very easily or very strong. And remember, soils don't, and nitrate is an anion. Soils don't have good anion exchange capacity here in Maryland. They don't have a lot of built-in positive charges that can attract that, that can attract that negative charge. So there's not a lot of anion exchange capacity in the first place, and nitrate has a very weak charge. There's little that can grab onto it, and when it does, it can't hold it very, it can't hold it very much. Contrast that with phosphate. It's gonna be harder to make phosphate leach because even though there might not be a lot of anion exchange capacity in our soils here in Maryland, phosphate has three times the, the holding power because it's got three times the charge. So it's gonna be much easier to leach nitrate than it is gonna to be to leach phosphate. So if something's dissolved in the soil water, there's a part of that that's great, and there's a part of that that might not be. What about the fact that anions can stick to charges in the soil? Well, that's good in the sense that anions can stick in order to be around. Um, but what could be bad about that is that they could be held so tightly that they're never made plant available again. Maybe they're added, but they're in the soil for a while, and they, instead of just being attracted electrically to um, charges in a clay particle, maybe at some point there's a real bond that's formed, and so you essentially have the creation of a new mineral with that, um, with that plant nutrient, and so that means that it's gonna be a long time before that ever becomes available. So there's blessings to being dissolved, there's curses. There's blessings to, uh, to being retained by the soil, but there's curses, but it could become a curse too. And what's so interesting about phosphate is that phosphates, uh, phosphate really has this kind of Jekyll and Hyde character to it. Um, we add phosphate uh, initially, and it's dissolved in the soil water. Um, the soil can grab onto it fairly well because the phosphate has such a high, high negative charge, but at some point could grab on too hard. But we also know that phosphate can also leach through soils like a sieve. And, um, and so phosphate can have this Jekyll and Hyde character to it. And this Jekyll and Hyde character is one of the reasons why we've run into a phosphorus issue um, in Maryland, for many years, there was the, con the conventional wisdom said that you could add as much phosphorus as you wanted, and it was going to stick to the soil. That high, high negative charge, that high charge was going to just, it was, it was going to stick and not go anywhere. And then we found that it began, that we can actually make it leach. Um, let's see here. I'm going to skip over this one and get right to the Jekyll and Hyde character of phosphorus. So we know that phosphorus um, will stick to soils pretty well, but at some point doesn't anymore. And, uh, and let's, let's at least see that illustrated. Well, a lot of work has been done trying to figure out what is it that might be beyond, behind the fact that phosphorus sometimes 
can be held by the soil hard, sometimes can be held fairly loosely, and sometimes can't be held at all. And a pretty powerful quantity to calculate ends up being a very simple ratio. It's the ratio of moles of phosphorus to moles of aluminum and iron. We put the phosphorus in the numerator, we'll put the aluminum iron in the, um, in the denominator, and um, we get that ratio. And it turns out that in a lot of cases, when you get to about 0 0.1, 0 0.15, 0 0.2, where you have moles of phosphorus divided by moles of aluminum and iron, then a change in phosphorus's behavior occurs. Below that threshold, the phosphorus sticks pretty well to soil. Um, but you get beyond that, and phosphorus begins to become much more leachable. It becomes much more soluble. And you can see that illustrated here um, in two sets of data from uh, Tom Sims, who's a professor at the University of, of Delaware. And the idea behind identifying this ratio is that aluminum has got a highly positive charge, as does iron. Aluminum's got a charge of plus three by itself, iron a charge of plus three by itself. So they're highly charged positively. Phosphorus is, phosphate is highly charged negatively. So it makes sense that aluminum and iron are gonna be really good at retaining phosphorus. But the difficulty is if you add too much, their ability to retain phosphorus basically goes away. They've got too much of it stuck to them. There isn't any more room. And so any additional phosphorus becomes more, uh, become, is, is held less tightly. Now, why this, why the denominator of only aluminum and iron? I mean, phosphorus is negatively charged. It could also stick to calcium and magnesium. That's absolutely true. The, um, but in our, our soils in Maryland tend to be a little bit more acidic. And so their calcium and magnesium are just less abundant. In a drier place like Texas, they're much more dominant. And so, um, and so we'd have to take them into account when we think of the phosphorism solubility. But under acidic soils, a lot of it comes down to iron and aluminum. And why is that ratio, why do we get to that threshold at about 0.1 to 0.2? It's because there's a lot of other stuff in the soil. Soils are dirty. So there's a lot of other stuff in the soils that are attached to the iron and aluminum. They're already busy grabbing a bunch of things. They don't have all of their capacity available to grab, um, to grab phosphates. So very important concept for us here in Maryland. You can apply so much, but you can't. But if you start to apply more than a certain amount, um, we're going to run into problems. Hence, we have a a, we have a preoccupation with phosphorus here in Maryland because of this behavior. And we have uh, fairly complicated um, phosphorus loss risk assessments to do, like we have with the PMT. So what's the, right now we're counting up ways that essentially nutrients can leave the soil or become not plant available. We've looked at a few so far. We might not have the right pH. Um, we, um, um, the, the molecules might be inherently more soluble or they, uh, they might stick too hard to the, to the soil. Another way that we can lose nutrients is that they can form they, they can go into gaseous forms. They can be transformed into gaseous forms and then leave the soil as a gas. Let's look at two examples, both from the nitrogen cycle. There's a million ways to represent the nitrogen cycle. This happens to be my favorite one. I like it because um, it neatly and tidily splits things up. It forms up into forms that are gaseous or dissolved in water. That's aqueous or solid. And it also splits them up according to kind of the chemistry of that form of, of nitrogen. In, in environments with lots of oxygen, um, forms on the right-hand side are going to predominate or they're going to be created. 
in environments with uh, less oxygen, forms on the left are going to tend to persist or be created. So it's just a nice way to, uh, it's just kind of a nice way to organize the types of, of nitrogen there are and the, and the way that they, and the way that they show up. Now, Notice that we've got, we're, we're talking here about examples of nutrients being transformed into gases and then being lost. And notice that we've got two gaseous forms of nitrogen. We've got nitrogen gas and we've got ammonia gas. Now note, we can get nitrogen gas by starting off with nitrate. That's on the far right-hand side. And if we get that nitrate into a low oxygen environment, then we can turn that nitrate into nitrogen gas and it can just simply volatilize away. Another way to get a nitrogen gas is to take ammonium, that's NH4 plus, and we can volatilize it to become ammonia gas. So let's look at those two examples. How does this happen? All right, well, here's an example of a field with some um, higher and lower spots. And we had flooding in this field. And we can, uh, and there's two ways that we can get these plants fairly sickly, all right? Um, underwater logging, we can exclude oxygen altogether. And if we, and, and it only takes a few days to do that. You can get a soil totally saturated and with stagnant water for less than a week. And the plant roots and the bacteria are using up, they're breathing the oxygen that's present, but after a few days, the, um, they run out. The plants will run out first. The bacteria can still scam, scavenge some of that very rare oxygen, and then they completely remove it. And so that all can happen within just a few days. So one of the ways that we can make plants sick is by, by simply taking oxygen out of the root zones, making it impossible for the root to do any work. To, even though it's surrounded by water, we make it impossible for the plant to take it up because the plant root can't respire. Or we make it impossible for the plant root to take up any nutrients because the plant root can't respire to do the work to take these things in. So one way that we could kill plants in this situation is simply to have waterlogged soils. But another way to create stress on plants would be, let's say that the Let's say the water is there for a few days, but goes away. But that might be enough time to induce enough of an oxygen deficiency that, that we take in our nitrogen cycle, we take nitrate, and we turn it into nitrogen gas through denitrification. That anything, any arrow that goes to the left here is an arrow that's going to occur in a low oxygen environment. So, um, so we're creating a low oxygen environment. We're taking any nitrate that was there and bacteria are turning it into nitrogen gas. And so here we get a double whammy. We might have, we might have killed some crops because we simply, we took away the oxygen so the roots couldn't respire and therefore couldn't deliver, couldn't deliver water to the plant. But also we could have removed oxygen long enough that bacteria were forced to breathe something else they breathe the nitrate, they turn it into nitrogen gas. And by the time the water recedes and the soils are oxygenated enough again, what had been nitrate, the nitrogen simply isn't there anymore. It's because it, it was, was turned into nitrogen gas and volatilized away and there just isn't the nitrogen present anymore. And so we, we even though the plant hasn't been killed, we've induced a, nit a nitrogen deficiency in the soil. And so the plant is yellower as a result. Another way that we can create nitrogen gas um, where we might not want it is how we apply our nutrients and what we do afterwards. So on the left-hand side, we have a manure slurry injector. And on the right-hand side, we have a manure slurry spreader. And it looks like in the case of both these situations, it, um, it looks like it might be no-till. So I've got a table for you up here from what we in the Ag Nutrient Management Program call our info card. It's available on our website, pretty easy to find. 
if you need help finding it, please let me know, or please let Emily or Paul know. Paul Shipley will be very happy to point you to it. But it contains a lot of really useful information about, um, about different management practices and what the results might be for, as, regarding nutrient content. So what I have here is I have just a snippet of, of a table from our info card that talks about liquid manure and how it's applied and if it's incorporated and the amount of nitrogen that, or the amount of ammonium that although applied initially, how much of it is gonna stick around under dirt in certain situations. So notice that if we inject manure slurry into the soil, we, we simply retain essentially all of the ammonium that we've applied. Um, that's what the one means. 100% of what we applied is retained in the soil because we've injected it into the ground. Notice though, that if we spread it on the, on the soil surface without any type of incorporation, that we lose 55% of the ammonium that was present. And of course, these numbers are approximations, but they're getting at a basic truth. If we spread our slurry out and we let it dry out in place, then we're going to be losing a whole lot of the ammonium that, um, that we want present. Because typically when we're, we're, we're spreading, at least in the past, we've been spreading for nitrogen purposes. So this is another way that we can lose nitrogen because of volatilization. The explanation for this is terribly elegant. Um, earlier, we used a memnonic that had been provided to us by uh, Dr. Weil in the, in the UMD um, ENST Department, Environmental Science and Technology. I think his Nature and Properties of Soils book is now in its 15th edition, um, which is saying a lot. And uh, here is, here's an equation that Dr. Weil provides in that book, which I think is one of the most elegant equations that he's got in the whole book. Um, and it explains this phenomenon of volatilization. So on the left-hand side, we've got, an, we've got ammonium, the ammonium ion. That's what, that's what we're adding when we're adding sludge. At least it's one of the forms of nitrogen that we're adding when we're adding um, sludge or, or liquid manures. Um, and notice if that gets in the presence of a hydroxyl, that it will form, it will no longer be ammonium. It will become gaseous. It'll become gaseous ammonia and therefore could leave the soil. And also a water is formed. That's reading the, that's reading the, the formula from left to right. But we can also read this formula from right to left. Notice what it says. It says that if we've got, an, if we've got ammonia gas, but it's in the presence of water, then we can take that ammonia gas and turn it into ammonium. Another way to, to read this is that, again, reading from left to right, is that ammonium becoming ammonia gas is essentially a drying out process. You see, we start with ammonium, but we lose a water, and in losing a water, we turn our ammonium into a gaseous form and it leaves. That's precisely what's gonna happen on the right, in the right-hand picture if that stuff isn't incorporated. We might be spreading as a liquid now, but as it dries out, we're gonna be changing our ammonium to ammonia. We'll be changing it into a gas. Um, notice that there's another way to change ammonium into a gas too, not just a drying process, but also if in a, in an, a, in a basic environment, if we get ammonia in contact with a hydroxyl, then we can get that volatilization too. That's usually not a problem for us because our soils tend to be fairly acidic. But this idea that ammonia volatilization is a drying out process um, uh, can basically explains why if we spread our liquid manure out onto the soil surface, 
with no incorporation and we simply let it dry out, that we get the amount of volatilization that we do. That we lose about 55% of the ammonia that we, that we would really like to be retaining. So I think that's just a wonderful formula, very kind of basic idea, and it has so much explanatory power. And um, it's very easy to be intimidated by chemical formulas, but this is one that I just appreciate and love. And um, uh, so consider it. Now, another way that we can effectively new lose nutrients is that they can interfere with each other's uptake or that they can form insoluble compounds. So if we have, for example, on the left-hand side, we've got, if we've got those elements that are in excess, right? So for example, if I've got um, ammonium, calcium, or magnesium in excess, then it can induce a deficiency in potassium. Why is that? If I've got too many ammoniums or calciums or magnesiums, the, the plant might be overwhelmed by them and it doesn't take up enough potassium. And so we can effectively induce an, in, we can induce a deficiency. Um, we can induce a, a deficiency in the plant. What's very interesting is notice how these work. If I'm going to induce a deficiency, the nutrient in excess has to have basically the same charge. Like for example, potassium's positive, the nutrients in excess that if they're gonna compromise that have also gotta be positive. Look in the third, the third row down, if I've got too much chlorine, I can induce deficiencies in nitrate and sulfate. Those are all negatively charged um, elements. So, so that's, so we might have what might look like enough of a certain nutrient, but if we've got too much of something else, it can create a problem. Another way to have a problem is we might have, we have, we might have nutrients that are um, of opposite charge. And because they're of opposite charge, they might attract one another so strongly that they create something that's essentially insoluble. And when they do that, um, because of that insolubility, we've really lost the availability of that nutrient to the soil water. That would, an example of that would be phosphate binding too strongly with iron or manganese, et cetera. Another way that we can, that we can compromise our soil is that over time in humid environments where it's rainy, those humid environments can become increasingly acidic. And it's not that they can become increasingly acidic, they really do. And so what happens is, is that we get taken out of our sweet spot, the sweet spot between six and six and a half or six and 6.7. And so that's why we have to periodically and fairly often, once every three, once every four years, add lime. Because, uh, because, this, because this pressure to acidify is, um, is kind of built in to the, way, uh, to the way ecosystems work. And so let's look at some of these mechanisms whereby that can happen. How does soil acidity originate? All right, well, one of them, which could be slightly artificial, if we add ammonium as our fertilizer to our soil, when ammonium oxidizes and becomes nitrate, and it's gonna do this essentially in, just any soil where we're growing plants, if we add ammonium, it's going to be in the process of oxidizing. Because if we're growing plants, we essentially have a soil that is oxygenated. If it's not oxygenated, the plant roots can't function. So when we apply ammonium in an agronomic situation, we're applying it to an oxygenated environment. And what happens is that ammonium inevitably generates acidity. So we've got ammonium, coupling with oxygen, we create a water, it becomes, the ammonium becomes nitrate, but we get, we create two hydrogens. And so this is also, this also is going to happen as organic matter breaks down. When organic matter breaks down, organic nitrogen becomes ammonium first. And this, that ammonium is introduced or as it's in an oxygenated environment, will create acidity. So this is going to happen anytime organic nitrogen is 
breaking down, but it will be accelerated if we're adding nitrogen in the form of ammonium. If we add nitrogen in the form of nitrate, we won't get additional acidity because nitrate is because we're because we're not creating we're not creating an opportunity for this oxidizing process. Um, plant roots create or plants create organic acids. Also, and bacteria do so too. They create these acids to try to dissolve plant nutrients that are kind of stuck to minerals very hard. They try to break up those minerals and get those and get those nutrients into the soil water. So plants acidify their own environment. Over time, it can go a little too far, maybe. Rainfall is a huge factor. Um, anytime water gets an equilibrium with carbon dioxide, some of that, some of that um, carbon dioxide will become carbonic acid. And this is completely natural. So rainfall is naturally acidic. Even if there were no smokestacks around, rainfall would be a pH of about five and a half. And so if you're in more humid environments, whenever it rains, you're going to you're getting a pH of about five and a half falling. And over time, that's going to be slowly acidifying your soil. Completely natural. It has nothing to do with climate change. When we add more carbon dioxide, well, we're going to get even more carbon dioxide, carbonic acid. But even if we were at our, where we wanted to be at about 200 parts per million or 280 parts per million, the, um, we would still be getting carbonic acid forming because we're going to get this, this carbonation that occurs whenever there's any CO2 at all. And we need CO2 in the atmosphere, just not too much. Now, in the, in the presence of industry, in the presence of smokestacks, we can increase that rainfall acidity a whole bunch by the, by the additions of uh, nitro, uh, nitrogen and sulfur. When I was growing up, acid rain was a much, much bigger deal. And I think that, um, that, um, that it's much less of a strident concern nowadays than, um, than when I was growing up as a kid. Notice that when clays form, clays produce acidity. Do you remember how I told you that aluminum um, dissolved in water will create acidity? Here's how it does that. Here we've got this highly charged aluminum. It stresses out some water molecules and rips them apart. The aluminum grabs the negative ends and forms a neutral thing. It forms a precipitate, the beginning of a clay. But what's left over, dissolved in water, is acidity. So as clays form in water, we create acidity. And oftentimes folks will add sulfur to soil in order to, to acidify it. Look at the power of this reaction. They're applying elemental sulfur. Um, in the presence of oxygen, um, it will become sulfate and release tons of acidity as a result. So that's why elemental sulfur is used. Obviously be careful. This isn't a passive process. This is a, uh, this is a bacterially mediated process, um, just like nitrification is. So it takes some time for it to happen, but what a powerful reaction it is um, when it does. So there's a lot of ways that we generate acidity in soil. And for these reasons, we tend to get away from the sweet spot in soil fairly quickly. And that's why we have to lime. Another way that we can lose new, effectively lose nutrients in, in soil is that soil material that's too high in carbon can rob plants of nitrogen. Um, or, if, or really, soil that's too high in carbon induces bacteria to rob plants of nitrogen. So let's see, let's see how that works. In organic matter, we have a continuum of carbon to nitrogen ratios. Something like sawdust has a carbon to nitrogen ratio of 400 to one. In bacteria, we've got a carbon to nitrogen ratio that's much narrower, 10 to one. So for every 10 molecules or, or atoms of carbon in a bacteria, we've got one atom of nitrogen. With sawdust, we might have only one atom of nitrogen for every 400 atoms of carbon. 
So we've got in organic matter, we've got a continuum of this ratio, the carbon to nitrogen. And it turns out that there's a threshold at about a carbon to nitrogen ratio of about 25 to one. At that threshold, there's enough nitrogens around that when bacteria go about their business, um, they, there's enough nitrogens that they can simply scavenge the nitrogens that are present. They don't have to do a whole lot of work to get nitrogen. But above that threshold, nitrogen becomes more rare. And so there begins to be a competition between bacteria and plants for the nitrogen that's present. Unfortunately for plants, bacteria are really good competitors for nitrogen. And so at these carbon to nitrogen ratios above 25 to one, the bacteria outcompete the plants for, um, car for nitrogen. And so we could induce a nitrogen deficiency in plants if our soil material um, is, is above that threshold. So this is one of the reasons why, um, so for example, this is one of the reasons why we might add, we might take wheat straw or corn stover and we might treat it as a mulch. We put it on top of the soil, but we don't incorporate it in. Um, why we might take pine shavings or pine bark or hardwood bark, we might add it as a mulch, but we don't mix it in because the, those carbon to nitrogen ratios are really, really high. We don't wanna mix it with the soil. It can be very useful, but it's good as a soil protectant. It's not good as a soil amendment. It's why we wanna take fairly finished compost or something like alfalfa. We can add that directly to the soil as an amendment because those carbon to nitrogen ratios are narrower. There's more nitrogen present. And so, um, the, uh, so the bacteria don't have to compete against plants to get it. Here's an interesting one. This is a picture from the Eastern shore. This is a, obviously it's an agricultural field that surrounds an old family cemetery. Um, this is occurring in Wacomico County. And uh, there's a paper out in 2014, I think from researchers at Salisbury University where they looked at several of these and um, asked the question, what's the difference between the, uh, the relatively native cemetery soil and the, uh, and the surrounding agricultural soil? And here's what they found. They found that in the cemetery remnants that silt and clay content were relatively high, organic matter and total nitrogen were too, also, literally, they are high. The elevation is much greater, about half a meter. Whereas in the surrounding ag fields, the sand content was higher, mag magnesium content was higher, calcium, potassium, and sulfur. And they attributed this to, uh, to two things. Number one, um, continuous agriculture, even on and this would have been continuous moldboard agriculture over many years. And since then, we've kind of realized perhaps not to do that. But for decades and decades and decades, the use of, of, of moldboard plowing, completely flipping over the soil, keep it leaving the soil unprotected for very large periods of the year, even in flat landscapes, induced a lot of erosion. Um, and, um, but also agriculture has, has also created inputs in terms of liming and things like that, which mean that in the ag fields, we had some more magnesium and calcium in the soil than in the cemetery remnants. Now, why is it that we would get more erosion in, on a flat, in a flat landscape under a moldboard plowing? Well, we can, we can, we can reference uh, part of the universal soil loss equation to, uh, to see this. Um, the NRCS identifies something that they call the K factor in the universal soil loss equation. Um, it's, the, it's inherent soil erodibility. So sands are considered 
not that erodible. Sands might be very loose, but they're relatively massive. It's hard for water flowing. If water's flowing isn't that, if it's not flowing that fast, it's hard to remove those sand particles. Um, silts, on the other hand, they're loose but light. So they're much, much more erodible. So that, that can explain why the surrounding ag fields that have undergone erosion are much sandier than the cemetery remnants that have undergone less. Why is it that clay particles would uh, be more abundant in, um, in the cemetery remnants? For clay, it's a little bit more complex. Clays might be light, but they're not loose. They're really rather sticky. So pure clays are pretty hard to erode because the clay particles are so busy sticking to themselves. In this context though, clays are sticky, but there's a lot more surface area in silt than on sands. And so there's a lot more clays that stick to silts than to sands. And so as a result, the, um, we, get heightened clay in, we get heightened clay content in the cemetery remnants because we've got heightened silt content and the clays are sticking to them. Um, there just isn't as much surface area in the sands for the clays to stick to. So the, there are gonna be clays stuck to those sands, but not as many. So I think this is a very instructive um, example about the power, the power of erosion, even if in a flat landscape over time, to change soil properties away from fertile conditions to infertile conditions. And we might be able to prop up the fertility in the ag fields a little bit by additions, but um, look at what we're really missing. We're missing the stuff that gives us our cation exchange capacity, the organic matter of the clays, and we're missing, our, we're, we're missing the, kind of the total nitrogen content. So I think very instructive. And this is a, this is a homegrown example from the Eastern Shore of Maryland. Hey, Dr. Rupert, we are at yes, two o'clock now. Um, we do have one question you might want to get to um, yes. about planting. There's a question about if you plant cover crops, especially something like wheat uh, in the fall and incorporate them into corn stalks, would you see a high carbon to nitrogen ratio in the spring? Well, so ask, I'm sorry, Emily, ask that question one more time. If you were to plant fall cover crops, like wheat, for example, specifically, and then in the fall and incorporate it into corn stalks, um, would you see a high carbon to nitrogen ratio in the spring? So, or I assume incorporate it and then plant corn is kind of what oh, the question is okay. getting at. Yeah, very good. Thanks for that question. Um, we have a habit in the agricultural nutrient management program that when we, uh, so when we write a nutrient management plan, if, um, if there might be some residual nitrogen in the soil because of use of a legume from the year before or use of manure from the year before, that uh, will provide a credit for some of that nitrogen from, a, from the previous year to go into the, to the, to the next crop the next cash crop the following year. However, what we do is we negate that manure or that legume nitrogen credit if in the intervening time, we have grown a small grain cover crop, a small grain cover crop being something like wheat or barley or rye. And the reason for that, we don't even have to incorporate it into the soil. If we incorporated it, we might make the problem even a little bit worse. But, but simply by growing that small grain cover crop that has a fairly high carbon to nitrogen ratio, what we're doing is we're adding this very high carbon to nitrogen ratio material in the ground with so much carbon present that the bacteria are gonna be scavenging for nitrogen in order to build themselves. Remember, to build a bacteria, you've got to have one nitrogen for every 10 carbon atoms. You've got to have a lot of nitrogen. So if we're creating a soil environment without a lot of nitrogen, because we've added so much carbon to it, 
then the bacteria are going to be very aggressively scavenging that, um, that nitrogen. And as a result, there's going to be a deficiency in available nitrogen for plants that follow. So the answer is absolutely yes. And you don't even have to plow it in. Um, all you have to have is, is have it there. Any other, any other questions at this time? Well, I think we calibrated it almost perfectly because here's the last slide, all right? The, um, we know that there's a bunch of ways to lose uh, nutrients. And we know that one of the ways is erosion. And so this is just a cautionary thing here. Um, this is work done by a geologist who surveyed, who did a literature review and surveyed erosion rates um, in different contexts. So here we've got erosion rates underneath, under agriculture, millimeters of, of material lost per year, spans a bunch of different orders of magnitude. We have erosion rates as measured in mountain situations, alpine situations. Um, soil erosion rates under, in, in soil mantled environments corresponds roughly to the environment in Maryland where we have sloping, we have uh, sloping fields, we have soils developed in place like in the Piedmont. And then lastly, we have erosion rates in what geologists called cratons, which, is, which are geologically speaking, the inert, geologically dead cores of continents where conditions are very, very flat. So notice in those relatively geologically inert areas that are very, very flat, we have the lowest erosion rates. Where we have sloping landscapes where soils are developing in place over rock that's close to the surface, we have on average higher erosion rates. Where we've got steep slopes and soils jutting up into the sky, in like in alpine situations, we have much higher rates. And notice how agricultural erosion rates are most similar to alpine erosion rates. Um, Historically speaking, plowing with mold boards, doing a lot of tillage has given us erosion rates that are similar to erosion rates in steep mountainous situations. Not a good thing. So our historic practices have, uh, have, have, have really created a lot of erosion. Now this gray band here corresponds to what the NRCS uh, discusses as tolerable soil loss values, um, which are, the idea there is to identify erosion rates that can be sustained over the long term because they roughly approximate, uh, they roughly approximate soil building rates. But what we can see is that what, what's considered tolerable soil loss rates really aren't that tolerable. When we, when, we, when we compare erosion rates um, kind of in these different situations. Uh, what, are, what we consider, what we call tolerable soil erosion rates are really more like erosion rates in alpine situations or in extreme situations like we encounter here in Maryland with fairly, under fairly high slopes. Um, those same erosion rates are, the, are similar to what we get when we do agriculture kind of in the conventional way. So we know that erosion is one way that we can lose our nutrients and, um, and we wanna minimize it. And that's why we should be so proud of our Maryland farmers and so supportive of no-till um, agriculture, so supportive of the use of cover crops where we keep our soils covered creating agricultural erosion rates that are much lower, agricultural erosion rates that are much more similar to what might be sustainable. So, um, so ending on a good note, in Maryland, we've adopted some of these practices a lot faster than other people have. And some of these practices are ones that we need to have in order to create our soil fertility writ large and not just soil fertility um, written in the narrow sense of providing the right nutrients just at the right time. So it's been two hours. Thank you all so much.
if you've got if if we touched on some things that you'd like more information on, then please include it in the chat. Please reach out to me or Emily or Paul. We'd love to produce more webinars about more specific uh, topics if you'd like. So let us know. Thanks so very much. Thanks, David. And we do have some um, questions about uh, additional nitrogen needed to counter the rye cover crop. Um, if you can just send us an email about that question, um, we can get you a detailed answer. Um, again, my email is posted in there. Let me just share this screen with a few. Hopefully I'm sharing my correct screen. Do you see the uh, slide there, David? I do. Okay, great. Um, so I'm sorry we didn't have time to get to all the questions. Uh, just email us if you have uh, if you if you want clarification on those. And we have another webinar coming up in two weeks at the same time. Go ahead and register for that to get additional CEUs, and we'll uh, get a little deeper into some specific applications of this. Um, all right. Thank you all for participating. And no, you don't need to send me your number if you included it in your registration. Thank <laughs> you.